Now, since you're watching this video, I'm going to make the assumption that you're one of those individuals that wants to explain everything from why and how water boils all the way up to how DNA gives rise to the complexity that is life. And you can't do this without understanding polarity. That's right. You need to be able to explain how it is that molecules possess an overall polarity. Now, how do we do that? Well, we need to go back and quickly review electronegativity. Now, if you remember, electronegativity is a value that's assigned to atoms based on how they interact with other atoms in a bond. And the one that exhibits a greater pull for the electrons within a bond, we say, has a higher electronegativity. And the one that has a lesser pull of the two has a higher electropositivity. So what that gives us is a polar bond. That is, much like the poles on the very Earth that you're sitting on right now, or standing on, or hovering slightly above, is that it has a north and a south pole. We can say, in fact, that it has a dipole. There are two poles. And much like that, with a bond, we have two ends of a pole as well. We have a positive end, and we have a negative end, and that's determined or established by the electronegativity. In fact, within a given bond, we can even indicate that and symbolize that by an arrow. And this arrow is a little different than a normal arrow. It's got a plus sign at the end, at the electropositive end, showing the dipole moment, that is, the density or increasing density of the electrons around the more electronegative atom. And we can also use a lowercase delta to help us figure that out as well, or help us signify that as well, with the delta negative being the electronegative end and the delta positive being the electropositive end. But how does that help us explain molecular polarity? Well, we have to remember that electronegativity is calculated between two bonded atoms, only two bonded atoms. So even if we have multiple atoms in a molecule and multiple bonds in a molecule, we don't ever add these up numerically anyway. But we can add these up in sort of a vector sum addition if we consider the overall movement or moment of those electrons towards the electronegative elements. And we're going to use, again, much like we did in the last video, ammonia to help us out. So the procedure that we are going to use is first we have to go through and draw a Lewis structure, then we have to represent this in three-dimensional space, and as we can see here, we have an ax 3 class molecule, sorry, an ax 3 e class molecule. It is a trigonal pyramidal molecule, and we have the hydrogens at the peripheral ends, and we have a central nitrogen with a lone pair of electrons around it. Now, it should be noted that even though that lone pair of electrons, they are negative electrons, uh, do possess a negative charge, they aren't considered when we figure out the overall polarity, not directly at least, but they do impact the overall shape, and therefore how all of these arrows are going to add up to give us the overall polarity of the molecule, if any. Now what we do is we calculate the individual electronegativity difference between each one of these. And we can see that if we do that, the nitrogen has a slight electronegative charge, while the hydrogens, the terminal ends, are slightly electropositive. And if we put the arrows in to indicate that, we can see that the overall moment of this particular molecule, that is if we take a look at the sum of all of the arrows, they all seem to be pointing towards the nitrogen. So we would say that within this particular molecule, it has a dipole or possesses a dipole moment that is moving towards the nitrogen. And we can draw an overall molecular dipole like this. And we can say, in fact, therefore, that this ammonia molecule this NH3 is a polar molecule. But if we take a look on the other hand at, say, this molecule, which is carbon tetrachloride, we can see that this is an AX4 class tetrahedral molecule. Both of the molecule examples that we've taken a look at have the same number of electron domains, it's just that our electron domain geometry is a little bit different with this one because all of the electron domains possess bonded pairs of electrons, while there's one lone pair with ammonia. Now, as we move over to this one, we can calculate all of the electronegativities. But if we look at all of these electronegativities, even though there is a very great electronegativity difference towards the chlorines at the end of all of those bonds and away from that central carbon, there is no clear end of this molecule. That is, it exists symmetrically in three-dimensional space. So any way you move it, symmetrically it is the same. So there's no top or bottom to this. And as a result, even though all of these bonds are polar, the molecule itself is not. So even though, again, we have highly polar bonds here, the molecule, due to its symmetry, 
is not itself a polar molecule. So what we have to remember is that all of these parent shapes, because they're symmetrical, if any of these bonds are the same, and that is they cancel each other out in terms of their dipoles, even if all of the bonds are polar, the molecule itself, due to its symmetry, is nonpolar. It should be noted, though, that if we have different peripheral atoms within a variant shape, that it is certainly possible to have a polar molecule there, and it is possible to have a nonpolar molecule variant if the electronegativity difference is quite small. So as we go through drawing this, a good step-by-step -step procedure would be to first figure out the three-dimensional shape, second figure out the electronegativity difference of each of the bonds in that particular molecule, third try and figure out which way the overall dipole moment is moving. If it's a symmetrical molecule and all of the bonds are the same, they're all going to cancel out, cancel out and you're not going to have a polar molecule. However, if you have a variant shape, as I like to call them, and we have all of these bonds being the same, or even some of them having different electronegativities, what you're likely to find is that there's an overall movement or moment towards one end of the molecule, hence making it a polar molecule. Remember that the arrow points towards the more electronegative end of the bond and the more electronegative end of the molecule because the electron density is greatest around there, so we say that the dipole moment moves towards the more electronegative elements in a particular molecule, and then the other end is the electropositive end. So in summary then, if we don't have a symmetrical molecule with all of the bonds and their bond polarities being the same, we can take all of these individual bond polarities, create a vector sum addition of all of these, which will in turn create a molecular dipole, and in fact tell us whether or not the molecule we have is polar or nonpolar. So now, hopefully after watching this and several other videos in the series, you're able to take a molecular formula, draw a two-dimensional structure, use Vesper theory to figure out its three-dimensional structure, use the electronegativities to establish the bond polarities of all of the different bonds within that particular molecule, and then, if any, figure out the overall polarity of that molecule to establish whether or not the molecule you've drawn is polar or nonpolar. Thanks for watching.